the Smithsonian uh, American Art Museum exhibition, African American Art in the 20th Century that we opened just a handful of weeks ago. So I'm Patricia McDonald. I'm director at the Wichita Art Museum, and I'm introducing the Breathe Project, um, our program this evening, and its mastermind, Kevin Harrison. But let's start then with Kevin, man of many talents and so many different activities. By day, Kevin is the Community Engagement Coordinator at Wichita State University. That's with an eye to expanding access and deepening inclusion all across the campus and um, outside of the workplace is really an exceptional musician. Um, he's got an instrument that he brought this evening for a treat. Um, and he's worked for um, a while uh, as an entertainer before he got pulled back to the academy to earn a master's in business and a doctor in educational leadership. And in his bio, Kevin states that he is, quote, an artist and a storyteller above all things. Well, he's additionally a creative writer. He already has one book under his belt um, and a second is in development. That brings us to the Breathe Project for this evening. And Kevin will introduce that, give us a uh, background and context for it. Um, it. So, but I want to take a minute uh, regardless to boast about this really exceptional and deep uh, video. The killing of George Floyd this past spring um, struck us all, it was recorded, um, and it shocked and hit a very deep nerve. Kevin saw that outpouring of outrage, I would say, as a, a moment to correct or adjust misconceptions. Misconceptions about a very proud history for African-Americans in Kansas, positive model of black men in the United States and in Kansas through the power of storytelling and of song. And essentially, that's what we're about to see and witness this evening in the Breathe Project. It has been such a success that the Kennedy Center, so the Kennedy Center of Performing Arts in Washington, DC, collected this project for recognition in its arts okay, across the program. Okay. So without much more fuss and fanfare, fanfare, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Kevin Harrison to the podium. For those of you who are out there in Zoom land, pay attention to um, your sound. You're, you're gonna to wanna to turn your sound off, off so you're not sharing your commentary with everybody who's joined us. So proud to welcome Kevin Harrison to the Wichita Art Museum and to this podium. The Kennedy Center on a national level, saw some of the things that we were doing locally and they took an interest in it. So they promoted the Breathe Project on their national platform and we're grateful for that. We're also grateful that I'm able to speak to you today from the Wichita Art Museum because what that tells me at the art, the art museum here in Wichita gets it. And they have a wonderful, wonderful display of African-American art right now, as does the Ulrich Museum and the Kansas African-American Museum. So make sure you do yourself a great favor and go and see all of those things. But right now I wanna to talk to you just Real briefly, before I introduce the video so that you can see what we presented to the world from Wichita, Kansas, with the help of our friend center. Um, and what I wanna speak to you about is, hopefully you noticed the song that I played was Amazing Grace. And I went back and forth between playing it really traditionally and also playing it more expressively and soulfully. And I did that for the simple fact to point out that one way is not wrong and the other way right or vice versa. We all have different experiences and so we should have the freedom to express ourselves as we've experienced life. All of us are trying to make sense of the world that we see. And so the way that I make sense of the world may be different than the way that you make sense of the world. And that's okay. When I experience God's grace, 
I may experience sorrow and triumph and disappointment and heartache and good times and bad times differently than you do. And so if you experience it in a traditional manner and I experience it in a more expressive manner, mm -hmm. that's okay. And that's the reason why I'm really proud to be a part of this initiative with the Wichita Art Museum because art has the power to transform minds and inspire critical thought. And so come down here and be changed by some of the art that's on display right now with the African-American art and throughout the year, there's always something good here. So I'm glad to be a part of it. That said, I was also glad to be a part of the Kennedy Center's presentation. So without any further ado, we're gonna show that. And then I'm gonna come back and speak to it a little bit more. And I'm gonna speak to you a little bit more about some history of the song, Amazing Grace that you might not have known about that together with this. So that said, we'll turn it over and I will see you in about an hour. Talk to you soon. Yesterday I was looking for something on TV. Turned to the news, saw somebody who looked like me. He was blind in his own, said he was
So uh, what you saw there was the first phase of the Breathe Project. And so what we did, we put a call out to African-American males because we felt like, okay, there is something going on. There are some stereotypes that are depicting us incorrectly for what happened to George Floyd to happen to George Floyd and even some of the Wichita George Floyd since George Floyd has kind of become an analogy for a situation even more so than just the person. We have more. Queer Smart and Icarus Randolph, who suffered and their family suffered similar instances, even right here in our own city and throughout the country. So we, we felt like we had to have something to, to bust these stereotypes, these, these deficit informed biases of black men. How could we, how can we kind of change that narrative? And so we thought, well, hey, art speaks in ways that policy and politics don't speak. So let's create something that's artful. And so I wrote the song. And then my good friend Sam Hines composed the music and we put out a call to African American males of all age, all backgrounds, all nationalities. And so we ended up getting 51 men between the ages of 10 being the youngest, the oldest being 73. We had straight men, gay men, tall men, short men. We had men who had high professions, men who had never graduated high school. You have engineers, you have doctors, you have educators, all walks of life showing us standing together saying, this is who we are, not what the media says we are, not what the movie Birth of a Nation said we were in 1915, but this is who we are. And so hopefully this generates some conversation. And so what the Breathe Project is all about is just really using art to speak to ways, speak to people in ways that, that traditional mediums don't speak to people. Um, that said, we took it one step further and we wanted to look at art and we wanted to look at the influence of art and artful minded people from Kansas or that has some type of Kansas connection and their influence on the world. And so um, good friends of mine, Kate and Kristen at um, Harvester Arts had reached out to me and had presented an opportunity with the Kennedy Center and the Kennedy Center put us on a national platform. We received feedback from people, not just in the United States, all over the world, different continents, different countries. And so we wanna share with you what the Kennedy Center shared with the world. So we'll do that at this time. Good evening, I'm Kevin Harrison and welcome to Wichita, Kansas, where we, the Brothers of the Breathe Project, believe that music and art should have a significant voice in speaking to social justice. Now, you're probably convinced yourself that Kansas is about as far removed from social justice reform as this wheat field where I currently stand. Open plains, agriculture, simple living, and little girls named Dorothy who fear the world outside of its comfortable borders and want nothing more than to click their heels and return home, right? Think again. Kansas is far more significant and diverse than what people realize. In fact, when it comes to a history of social justice, Kansas is just as significant as any state in the union, even many of those in the South. For the next hour, sit back and relax while we use song and narration to offer a small glimpse into how black people from Kansas have advanced race relations, moved mountains, and changed the world. 
with police killings of innocent black men and women, young kids being attacked by racial stereotypes and microaggressions in schools, and a nation that is more divided by race than it has been in decades, we feel it is a must to change dangerous biases and change conversations about the brilliance and significance of black people in America, even Kansas. Therefore, the question asked by Marvin Gaye in 1971 is not rhetorical. We demand answers when we ask the question, what's going on? Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. But all the time, I've been a climbing on and reaching landing and turning corner and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on them steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now. You know we got to find ways to bring some loving here today. Oh. Well, I still going, honey. I still climb. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair.
poetry you just heard infused throughout Marvin Gaye's classic, What's Going On, come from Langston Hughes, Mother to Son. When you think about a mother preparing her young son for a world that has been historically cruel to black men, it's sad to think that not much has changed from 1922 when Hughes wrote the poem to 1971 when Marvin Gaye recorded the What's Going On lyrics to today in 2020 when both artists' words are sadly still quite relevant. Thankfully, artists such as these men have used their gifts to shine their light in areas where policy and politics simply don't reach, which brings us back to Kansas. Many know that Hughes was a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance and that from 1942 to 1962, he was one of the primary writers for the civil rights movement. Others may know that Hughes was the author of countless plays, poems, short stories, novels, and children's books. What you may not have known about was his strong Kansas ties. Spending the majority of his childhood and experience in schooling in Topeka, Lawrence, and Kansas City, Hughes once told a Kansas audience, I sort of claim to be a Kansan because my whole childhood was spent here in Lawrence and Topeka and sometimes Kansas City. I was born by the river. Saint Cory. In the little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a
Well, we've uh, we give you a little R&B with Marvin Gaye and give you a little soul music with Sam Cooke. And we've even given you some black literature with Langston Hughes. And none of those probably come as any big surprise. As interesting as they are, you know that black people do poetry. You know that black people sing soul and we sing R&B. But the minute when black folks start singing country, people get a little bit upset, get a little bit uneasy for some reason. So much to the point that when Little Nas X came out with the hip hop country mesh song called Old Town Road, there was so much controversy on whether or not the song belonged on the country charts or not, which I personally thought that it did. Um, but obviously there were other people who didn't. Um, you also can look at Beyonce, one of the biggest stars in the world, but the minute there was a rumor that she may be performing on the CMAs, Country Music Awards, country music fans threatened to boycott the award show if Beyonce were to perform there. But why though? I mean, if you really know your history, you'll know that the African-American influence has been profound in influencing country and Western music. In fact, I would go as far as saying that country music is just as much an African-American genre as blues, soul, R&B, hip hop, jazz, and anything else that you can name. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Jimmy Rogers is considered to be the father of country music, but there was no doubt that he was heavily influenced by the songs of the African-American railroad workers who used to sing work songs while they worked. Uh, then there was uh, instruments like the fiddle and the banjo. Those instruments were brought here from Africa when enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas. And those are the primary instruments, especially for early country music. You look at the form of country music. Country music and blues mimic each other. They're both based on 12 bars. They're both typically in four by four time signature. And then there's usually this very similar lyrical pattern, which is three lyrical phrases spread over four bars. The very first performer to ever perform on the radio program called the Grand Ole Opry in 1927 was D. Ford Bailey an African-American artist. And then Hank Williams, who is one of the biggest uh, country stars ever. In fact, they say he's the genre's first real superstar. There was a, an artist named Rufus Payne, who was an African-American street performer who taught Hank Williams how to sing and play. And of course, uh, our beloved Ray Charles, who was just a master at all genres. One of his earliest bands was a uh, all white band with the exception of him called the Florida Playboys. And he was a member of that band. So again, country music and black folks go together like a hand in glove. Here singing an original song, The Breathe Project is proud to present Country Blue. We hope you enjoy it. Good afternoon, you've heard from me already on the videos, but I wanted to make sure I introduced the rest of the guys that are here with us today. Uh, I'm Kevin Harrison, and of course, we represent the Breathe Project of Wichita, Kansas. Um, a couple of you have texted in asking about the, the young man that's doing the painting. He's one of our local artists here in Wichita, Kansas. His name is Mr. Quintus Pinkson, we call him Q. Um, we asked him while we were performing to paint something that would inspire social justice. And so he's kind of going with the flow and painting what the music uh, inspires him to feel. Um, those of you watching, I'm sure his painting is for sale. So if you, if you uh, send a text message, we'll let you know how you can connect with him. Um, and then I'm gonna kind of go from my left to the right. The young man who you just heard seeing the Sam Cooke change gonna come is Mr. Chorus Antone, he spells that K-H-O-R-I-S-A-N-T-O-N-E. <laughs> and then moving over, you heard him on the Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, my very good friend, Mr. Rob Simon. Friend of mine, Mr. Bernard Gray, who you also heard featured on What's Going On. Harry Willis is to my right. And uh, he was the gentleman that you heard doing the mother to son poem by Langston Hughes. And a lot of you probably didn't know that Langston grew up in Kansas. So you're welcome for that information. This is Rudy Love Jr. Uh, he's the son of Rudy Love, a historic soul legend who's from right here in the city. If you, if you don't know about it, Google him. I think you'd be 
uh, in for a, a pleasure if you do so. And then all the way to the end is another good friend of mine. I watched him grow up into become a fine young man. Uh, that's Miguel Jocelyn. And then I want to introduce you to the band also. They're behind us. You have uh, on the bass, Mr. Charles Jackson. We call him Charlie Ray. We have two drummers. Right now you see the 10-year-old drumming sensation, Samuel Hines Jr. And then the other drummer that's standing off to the side is his uncle, Thomas Hines. And then to the right <laughs> is the keyboard extraordinaire and our musical director, Mr. Samuel Hines Sr. And then last but not least, we want to just send us couple special acknowledgments and kudos to Wichita State University for being a part of this. Also for Harvester Arts. Uh, we definitely thank our friends at Harvester Arts for allowing us this time to visit with you today. Um, Textron, who um, Textron Aviation is, has always been very kind to us as well. Um, Dr. Marche Fleming Randall and um, a couple other people too that I've I'll probably mention a little bit later on, but thank you so much. But we talked a little bit about country music, and so um, we told you black folks sing country, so we're black folks, and we're going to sing some country. We hope you enjoy it. This is an original song called Country Blue. <laughs> Tell them that I'm not country, the color of my skin. What about me says I'm not country, the town that I'm living in. And who are they to say I'm not country, and what does it matter to them? Well, I'm country now, and I was back then. I got country family and country friends from a little old church with old wooden pews. Where the country kids play in worn out shoes I like cornbread, Kool-Aid, and whiskey too Cause I'm country This is country blue Hey, hey this is country blue Help me sing this song I say to hey, hey Well, I'm country I'm country Says I'm not country, is it my nine to five? What about me? Says I'm not country, that old pickup that I drive. I never shucked corn and never plowed fields, but I slept on a bed of dapper deals. The only horse I rode had training wheels. I was country back then, and I'm country still. I like tossing back beers and playing horseshoes, making something out of nothing with my tools and fuse. I like cornbread, whiskey, and Kool Aid too, cause I'm country. This is country blue. in the country people say stuff like my mama Neil. I was about 40 when I realized what that mean but that mean mama and everybody else right so my mama Neil from a little old bitty town it's called Fort Gibson one traffic light about 3,000 people nothing much to do with fish but I can remember like yesterday It'd be about midnight and you can see beautiful clear sky and stars my granddaddy he used to look up into the heavens and he would whistle I don't whistle good as him, but I'm gonna do my best. Sound of something like this. I'm 
myself to sleep at night Thinking about all the warm summer times We'd play all day and fish all night Berries off the bushes and mosquito bites Wagon wheels, catfish gills, and strawberry fields Now that's country Bass and jars, stringing guitars, and looking at stars Now that's country Bumblebee stings, inner tube swings But the most important thing Now that's country Love that ease the pain I said I love replaces the rain Now that's country it makes the gray skies blue it makes the heart be true. Now that's country. And it makes me feel brand new. And I'm country. And this is country blue. This is country blue. country but we also love the fact that it has its course corrections over time and god knows we needed course correction because exclusion has been part of our existence here not just at lunch counters and not just from country music and not just from being able to vote but even in the entertainment field thank god for wichita kansas though because we uh we can boast being the home of the first african-american to ever win an oscar and that is Hattie McDaniel for Gone with the Wind. Now, you know, sad part about that is, is that because she was African-American, she wasn't even allowed to uh, to attend the premiere in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, nonetheless, Hattie blazed a trail for blacks in Hollywood, the same way that civil rights leaders did for voting and schooling and equal access. Some of Hattie's relatives still live here today and they're a constant reminder of the greatness that comes from black people right here in the state of Kansas and even right here in our very own city. So we salute you, Hattie. So, so it's three total, it's not oh, four. It's live. <laughs> Thank you. 
The journey of Blacks in America has been a soulful journey. It has been a poetic journey. It has been a strategic journey. It has been a down-home country journey. And yes, a spiritual journey. So Walk With Me, Lord, is definitely fitting for today's soundtrack. Legendary filmmaker, photographer, composer, and author Gordon Parks is another great Kansas pioneer who represents these journeys. A native of Fort Scott, Kansas, Parks is known for three major motion pictures, The Learning Tree, Shaft, and Superfly, as well as over 13 published books, several music compositions, and one of America's most significant collections of photos. In his book, A Choice of Weapons, Parks talks about how he chose his camera as a weapon to fight racism, poverty, and social injustice. Here is Parks explaining this in his own words. In the early 1940s, a young photographer, Gordon Parks, got a call to come to Washington. With the success of the FSA, its role was being expanded. Roy Stryker believed that photographs could be used to combat racial discrimination. He began by showing Parks how things really worked on the streets of the nation's capital. So Roy Stryker asked me a few questions and said, what do you, you know, really know about the city? And I told him, he said, hmm. He said, well, I'm going to give you an assignment. Your first assignment, put your camera on the shelf. I want you to go to Julius Garfinkel's store, buy yourself a top coat. There's a restaurant directly across the street. And then there's a motion picture house down the, in the same block. So to make the story short, each one of them gave me short shrift. I, uh, I didn't get a coat at, at the department store. When I went to the restaurant, man said, don't you know Negroes have to eat in the, on the other side, the back? You can't come in this side. You have to get your food into the back. And of course, I didn't even get in the movie house. That's the way it was. So I was astounded. And I went back and Roy saw me walk in and he smiled. He said, well, how did it go? <laughs> I said, well, I think you know how it went. He said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. What do I do about it? He said, well, what did you bring your camera down here for? Just like that. I said, oh. So he left, and the only person left in the building was a black woman, a charwoman, who was sweeping the floor and mopping. So I introduced myself. She told me her name was Ella Watson, and I asked her if I could photograph her. Photograph me like this? I said, yes. I had really thought of Grant Wood's picture of the American Gothic. I put a broom in one hand and a mop in the other and told her to look directly into the camera. Well, that picture has become the best known picture of all of my work. I showed it to Stryker three mornings later. He said, well, you're getting the idea, but you're going to get us all fired. <laughs> said, this is a government agency. And that picture is an indictment against America. And I realized uh, from the reaction of people that the camera could be a, a very powerful instrument against discrimination, against poverty, against racism. We are getting close to the conclusion of our program, and I'd be remiss not to mention a few organizations that help make this possible. First and foremost, the Kennedy Center for Recognizing Wichita, Kansas for Your Arts Across America campaign. This is awesome, and we're just so glad to be a part of. We also want to thank Harvester Arts for helping us secure this spot on Arts Across America. So uh, definitely want to thank our friends at Harvester Arts. The Reimagine Community Research Foundation, thank you for your support. Of course, Textron Aviation, who supports everything that we do. And then, of course, last but not least, Wichita State University, where we're standing today on the campus of Wichita State at the beautiful John Bardo building. The late John Bardo had a vision that this building be the only vision, the only building that, that faces outward toward the community, where all the other ones face inward toward the campus. And his vision was that he wants people from the community to come and see what we have going on on campus. So definitely kudos to Dr. Bardo and the Wichita State. That said, in the spirit of, of a change going to come, a change doesn't come without change agents. So we want to salute a very special change agent from right here in Wichita, Kansas, a man by the name of 
Donald Hollowell. Now, a lot of people, have, I think everyone has heard of Dr. Martin Luther King, but a lot of people don't realize that he had an attorney from right here in Wichita, Kansas. That's right, Donald Hollowell was Dr. King's attorney. Not only did he get Dr. King released from Georgia State Penitentiary, Hollowell also is responsible for integrating the University of Georgia. A couple other things, President Lyndon B. Johnson appointed him to be the president or the director of the EEOC. And of course, um, some of his voter registration initiatives increased African-American voters being registered by two and a half million people. So there's a few things you can read about. And he did a whole lot of other exciting things as well. But we definitely want to salute you, Donald Hollowell. And again, we want to salute the entire city of Wichita for the contributions that African-Americans have made to the world from right here in Wichita, Kansas. Hey, we are back. We hope you've enjoyed yourself so far. Again, we are broadcasting live from Wichita, Kansas. And for those of you who have never been here, we hope by now that you see the city is about more than just corn stalks and wheat fields and little girls named Dorothy. And yes, we do have black people here. So probably it was a surprise to some of you folks on the East Coast and West Coast. Um, nonetheless, we love you. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit. I want you to meet some of the guys from the Breathe Project. Um, I just wanted to just recap what we learned so far. We learned about the very first African-American Oscar winners from Wichita, Kansas, and that's uh, Hattie McDaniel. One of the most important filmmakers and photographers in history is from Fort Scott, Kansas, so hopefully you learned a little bit about Gordon Parks. We talked about a significant civil rights attorney who's right here from Wichita, Kansas, and that's Donald Hollowell. And then um, we talked about Langston Hughes, who is a big part of the Harlem Renaissance, but a lot of people didn't know that he spent most of his childhood in Lawrence, Kansas and Topeka, Kansas, which is not even an hour and 45 minutes north of here. So um, Kansas has best, definitely been significant in promoting art that speaks to civil rights. I uh, wanted to also just remind you of our sponsors. Again, we had a Textron in Wichita State and Dr. Marche Fleming Randall at Wichita State. Um, again, we want to thank Harvester Arts for all that they do for us and for the community as well. And again, I want you to meet someone other than me because you've heard me talk. So we're going to talk to a couple of guys here at the Breathe Project. I think I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Rob Simon. He's a local educator. He does so many amazing things in the community. And I'm just going to have him speak to kind of his interpretation of what the Breathe Project is and what it means to him. Well, I would just start by saying, um, I'm thankful to be part of it because it's just a way to get a message out to the world that um, that black people matter. You know, it's like there's a lot of controversy now because of how some people are going about making that message happen. But what Kevin wanted us to help do is put out a positive message to say that there's a lot um, that's that's going on in the world that's that black people are responsible for. And so the Breathe Project has been one of the ways that we have an opportunity then to do things in a positive way that makes it possible for folks to look at us perhaps in a different light than they do. So, so often people get their information about what it's like to be in any kind of cultural group other than their own from what they see on television and in movies. And of course, those are created images that don't necessarily reflect what reality is. And so the Breathe Project for me is just an opportunity to be part of messaging in the world in a way that helps people to see who black people really are and what we really contribute. It's like we just need to get to know our neighbors, and our neighbors may li live next door, or they may live across town, or they may live in a completely different city. But when we get to know one another, we get to understand that there's more to us that we have in common than the things that separate us. Thank you so much. I think uh, all the people watching are quite intrigued by uh, Quintus, who's been back there painting diligently throughout the whole program. So. We're gonna let we're gonna let Quinn speak a little bit and say what's on his mind as well. Hey everybody, I'm Quinn Pinkston, a local artist here in Wichita, born and bred. These young wheat fields out here. Um, my piece is just a reflection of the music that I've heard being sang. I didn't come to the sound check, so I will be moved by the spirit as the spirit it came about me. Um, what I have here is a, a brother who's changed a couple of times since I started painting, but it's just. It shows the stress and the joy of the, the black man in, in this society. You know, there is some foot that's on our neck, maybe visible or invisible. Sometimes we even put the, the foot on our own necks. You know, the, the object, and the, 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 the message that I'm get, trying to get across, and although the breathing may be rough, as the word breathe is, 
you got to take that breath in order to preserve the life. As soon as you start breathing, the death sets in. Mm -hmm. So this is what my piece is supposed to convey, and I hope it does for you and everybody else at home. Thank you. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Rudy Love, Jr., and then we'll hear from someone from the band. Hey, um, I just want to say uh, this is such a special thing to me. Um, you know, it's important to me because I want everyone to feel the way that I feel being surrounded by you know, all these talented black men. Uh, it's nothing but positivity. The, the energy is, is just, um, if we can express that in any kind of way. So someone who thought they, you know, knew what black people were, who knew who black people were, you know, like had uh, an idea of us, uh, preconceived notion. I hope that we break every single idea, you know, um, because really we, a diverse group of folks, um, each with brilliant minds, you know, so, uh, yeah, I just, I'm really proud to be a part of this. And, uh, And of course, uh, we want one of our band members to speak to you as well. We have such a talent. Give it up for the band. We have such a talented band. <laughs> Very talented individual. So we want to hear from, from perhaps Mr. Sam. Um, thank you, It's important to me that uh, that I teach him, and and even those that are around me, um, that um, to change the narrative that we do deserve the right to breathe, and that's all we want to do is we want to breathe. Um, and so, once again, I thank you all, all of you who have tuned in um, to be a part of the Breathe Project. Thank you. Uh, for allowing us to come into your homes and share our gifts and talents um, with you. Um, uh, once again, to these fine young men, Samuel Hines Jr., he's 10 on the drums, um, Charlie Ray on the bass, uh, and then my other brother over there who was on the drums, Thomas Hines, um, and to all of these wonderful singers and musicians and um, audio techs, to everyone, thank you so much for having us um, and look us up on Facebook. We're on Facebook, uh, Breathe The Breathe Project, uh, right here in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you. So we have uh, one last song for you and we uh, definitely hope you've enjoyed us up to this point. And then we have a video that you can also go back and re-enjoy um, through the Kennedy Center site or through YouTube. You can find the video under The Breathe Project as well. But we just want you to be mindful of Dr. King's historic words on uh, August 28, 1963, when he shared his dream to the world. And this is a dream that we definitely still believe in, and we want you to believe in that dream too. Um, we definitely want all people to subscribe to the belief that there's only one race, the human race. Um, and we speak to that through art. We, th we speak to that through singing and songwriting and painting because we believe that art touches people and moves people in ways that politics and policy don't. Policy and politics are definitely important, but we think art is a significant voice in those narratives as well. So a very familiar song featuring the gifted Mr. Samuel Hines. This is We Shall Overcome.
walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. Hope you enjoyed the music video. Again, that was 51 African-American males from here in the city, age 10 to 73, including the 10-year-old drummer that you just saw on the Kennedy Center presentation. And um, also, I hope you enjoyed the, um, the actual Kennedy Center presentation as well. I um, mean, just some of the history about this great state of Kansas that we live in and some of the people who have really went out in the world and made a difference that are either from here or that have some type of connection to Kansas. Um, I have a couple slides I'm going to go through, PowerPoint slides, and then um, I'm open to take some questions from anyone that wants to send them through the chat. One question that I want to address right away is someone had asked earlier, was the song Country Blue available on iTunes? And no, it's not, but it's been recorded and it will be. Give it, uh, I don't know, give it a couple weeks and it, it should be available. So that said, um, I started out with the song Amazing Grace and I played it two different ways to show that you can have different perspectives on the same thing. The person you see on the left is uh, John Newton. John Newton is the, uh, well, I guess he's the alleged author of the song, I'll explain. So the song was published in 1779. John was a slave trader by, by profession. And so on one of his many voyages from 
Africa to the Americas, carrying a load of what his manifesto called human cargo. I called them beautiful black hostages, beautiful black kidnapped people. But what his manifesto said was human cargo. So we'll use that language. And they were chained together like sardines, somewhat similar to the picture that you see on the right. According to John Newton's manifesto, the wind and the weather got really rough and they thought that everyone on the ship was going to die. And then suddenly all of the individuals who were captives on this boat started humming together. And I have to keep in mind that Africa is not a country, it's a continent, the second biggest. And so these are not people who have common customs or even a common language, but according to the legend, they started humming the melody of Amazing Grace in cadence with the weather and the calm, the calming came. The winds, the storm, and the waters calmed. And then later, John put the lyrics to it. And now today you have America's most popular Christian hymn. I said that to say this, this is evidence that we can work together. If the slave and the slave master can co-write America's most popular hymn under those conditions, then think what we can do if we break down the barriers that we have, these socially constructed barriers, these things that are not real, that cause us to think we're different when we're really alike. If we can break those barriers down, think about how far we can move forward. And again, speaking to the Art Museum and the Breathe Project and anyone who creates art, art helps us to, relieve the, to remove those barriers. I do believe that. That said, I want to speak a little bit about when the Wichita Art Museum was open. I believe it was 1915, and these people here correct me if I'm incorrect, but I think it was 1915, so we're going to go with that, which is the same year that the movie Birth of a Nation came out. And so this is the movie by uh, Griffith, and I'm not going to have you go bore yourself and watch it for two hours. I'm going to give you the 15-second summary of the movie. Black men are savage, criminal, Lazy rapists of white women, but thank God for the Ku Klux Klan to come and save the day. These, these gentlemen of virtue and heroic nature, the Ku Klux Klan can come and save the day, which is ridiculous, but that is the reality of the movie. That's the first movie ever shown in the White House and Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of that time, call it cinematic brilliance. Now, if you think that that was the general narrative of the country at that time, then you also have to think that Maybe this beautiful place where I stand today, and I do support the museum, but maybe in 1915, it could have possibly been a part of some of those systems and those systemic things that caused the, uh, oppression. What I'm proud about is that I know for a fact, being a board member for the museum, is that the museum is not afraid to face that that might be a possibility. More so, they're reaching out to the community and they're saying, how can we use this art museum to speak to social justice? And how can we bring people of all types into the museum? So my call to you is to come out here and, and participate and see this museum, as well as the other museums that I saw, especially right now during the African-American art exhibit, which is 50 pieces from 35 different artists. And it's amazing. I've been through it and you should too. That's it. I want to move to the second slide, because when we talk about movies like Birth of a Nation, we talk about stereotypes that are still in existence today. There are still people that believe these deficit informed things to this day. Now, this is a picture of me when I'm four years old, bright eyed, bushy tail, ready to go change the world, capable of being anything that I wanted to be, just like any other four year old. But some people don't see that. Some people see an innocent kid as a threat just because they're different, just because of some ism. And there are a lot of different isms. You might not like me because I'm this color. You might not like me because of this sexual orientation, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, all of these are really dangerous and harmful threats. What you see here is the, the logo of the hip hop group Public Enemy. And that logo is a black man in the crosshair of a assault rifle. And of course, a bullet can hurt you, but there are other things that can hurt you. Biases and stereotypes, microaggressions, isms, and marginalization are just as hurtful, maybe not physically hurtful, but I think sometimes they can lead to physical damage. But even when they don't, the psychological and emotional consequences can be severe. When you think about marginalization, you think about things like redlining that took place in this city in 1937 when the city council took a red line and drew it through the city map and said, okay, 
Black people will live on this side of the red line and all of the good stuff will be on this side. And then you see one of the zip codes that was part of that still suffers today, 67214, last place in everything good, first place in everything bad. And so these type of stereotypes and these types of biases are damaging and not just for five, 10 years, but for decades. Now, Earlier, I said there's one race, the human race, and I stand on that. Not only do I stand on it, I'm going to prove it. If you look at this picture and I ask you which of these probably depicts my lineage, my ancestry, most of you are going to pick these kids in South Carolina in chains and not the people, the white people that say this is basically a white South Carolina Confederate family. The reality is that I'm both. My great, great, great grandfather was J.P. Mayfield. His father was J.P. Mayfield Sr. These men were from South Carolina, white men who fought on the rebel side of the Civil War. What I'm basically saying is that, again, there's one race, the human race. So inside my body, my beautiful black body, I might add, there is slave and white Confederate blood that flows neck and neck right beside one another because we're all the same. And I challenge you, if you look at your own ancestral lineage and your own DNA, you'll probably find something that shocks you as well. This was shocking to me. Oops. So again, I just wanted to summarize by, uh, by again, reminding you that we, we as, a, as a society really have to get past those biases, those stereotypes, those things that make us believe that we're different. And I shared with you five of the people on this picture who actually have Kansas connections who have went out and done that. So I won't restate their names. I just have their pictures up. But the one in the top middle you might recognize is George Washington Carver. And I wanted to just point him out because a lot of people don't know. He went to, high, he went to elementary school in Fort Scott where Gordon Parks is from, and he graduated high school in Minneapolis, Kansas. So a lot of people are not aware of that. So I thought I would share that as well because he went on to become a brilliant scientist as we all know, and not the inventor of peanut butter. So please correct anyone that tells you that. So again, just in summary, art's transformative. It can change minds. It can inspire thought. It can, uh, lost, the lost art of critical thinking, it can reignite that songs, poems, whatever the medium of art is, it can ease pain, it can form commonalities between people, it can express broad ranges of ideas. And therefore for artists, it's not an option, it's not a choice. Artists have an obligation to go out and change the world using those gifts that they have. And um, Once again, art can move society in ways that policy and politics never could. And a lot of the art pieces that you see here are examples of that. So come on out and enjoy the art museum. At this time, I will take any questions that you may have, you can send them through the chat. Any questions, send through the chat. Oh, and you can open the microphone and talk as well if you don't want to type it in. Kevin? Yes. This is Marnie Stone, and I wanted to ask you, what are, what's the next step for the Breathe Project? What do, you, what do you have up your sleeve? Oh, good question. Couple of things, the, the most immediate next step is we wanna do a calendar, and we wanna use this calendar to showcase African-American men throughout the community in, in a positive light. And we wanna also use the calendar to bridge the age gaps. A lot of times you see this separation between young people and old people. So we wanna use this as a fundraiser for some of the young sports groups and things of that nature. So the plan was initially to have that out for 2021 and, and just the whole COVID thing caused a lot of restrictions as far as trying to get everybody together. Um, you know, we got 51 men together to, to do the breathe video during COVID, as you could probably tell by the masks, and it probably wasn't the best idea, but I, I'm glad we did it. I think it, um, I, I think it, it made a big impact, but yeah, the next step is a calendar and, um, you know, we have a few other things following up behind that. Thank you though, for asking that question. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh-huh. 
And then someone asked, how can we support this project financially? That's a good question too, that I definitely want to answer. Um, reach out to me via email and, and let's talk about that. There are a couple of different ways. Um, and that is, I'm on Facebook under my name, Kevin Harrison. And also I can be reached at my Wichita State email, kevin.harrison at wichita.edu. And I'll be glad to discuss that with you. Anything else? I'm not, for, okay. Um, so the question was, am I aware of any other um, people doing brief type projects in other communities? At this point, I'm, I'm not. I would like to hope someone is doing something similar to that. I know that there was um, Jermaine Dupree, who's uh, a, a multi-platinum producer, did something with, uh, with recording artists, with national recording artists, similar to the Breathe video. But I don't know if they, uh, have went forward with it to do other things with it or not. Anything else? Got about two minutes. If anyone wants to ask a question, I'll be, be more than happy. Here is a question in the chat. Okay, um, are you doing any educational outreach or partnered projects with other museums around town? You know what, that's a great question. I'm not at this point, but I would love to. Um, I work in Wichita State, so if Ulrich will have me, I would love to be there. And, <laughs> I'm, a, and I'm a friend of uh, Miss Sherman at the Kansas African American Museum, so I will make, reach out to her and let her know that I'm available. Thanks for that question. And uh, Mr. Burks, Lieutenant Colonel Burks said, will this be posted for uh, re-airing? I'm not 100% sure, but I think someone here probably knows the answer that I just got was 100% yes. How did you get connected with the Kennedy Center? Thank you for asking that question. So um, I'm good friends with the ladies who run a, a nonprofit or art organization here called Harvester Arts. And so the Kennedy center contacted them and said hey we're looking for someone to represent your region that speaks to social justice through art and so uh, they reached out to me and we sit and we conversed about some different ideas and so we said hey let's do kind of a documentary with live music in between the segments and so that's what you got was what we just showed today How can we volunteer with the Breathe Project? You know, I'm hoping that we get real active again once um, once the, the restrictions of COVID lessen a little bit. You know, we, we had been invited a couple places to sing and I just didn't feel comfortable bringing 51 men to sing. Um, I think ideally the museum probably would have had this as a, as a public event rather than, than the way it is now. And so with so many unknowns in, in the world as, as we are adjusting to this new normal, that's kind of one of those things that I'll keep you posted um, and I'll give you that same email address because we definitely want the support. Kevin.Harrison at wichita.edu. Was the music video recorded at the Dunbar Theater? The outdoor scenes were recorded at the Dunbar Theater. The indoor scenes were recorded at Bishop Wade Moore's Church in downtown Wichita on Broadway. I loved the Dunbar socially distant singing, wish we could be there. Yeah, we wanted to give a tribute to the Dunbar because it's, a, it's kind of a staple in the black community and there's some efforts to bring that back to life. And so we wanted to do our part to at least showcase it in the video. I love to see a YouTube video series that keeps exploring these ideas and beautiful work further. Okay, note taken um, and good clarification. Okay, cool. It's 731. I don't know if you want me to stay up here or not, but if there's any other questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Other than that, about dinner time. Will tenacious men interact with brief project participants? So let me explain what tenacious men is. Tenacious men is a program that I oversee at Wichita State that is sponsored by Textron. And the it's, it's, it's not a black boy thing, it's a boy thing for all nationalities. And so it's kids in those community schools that surround Wichita State, three public schools in USD 259 and two private schools, one Catholic school and one private school. 
and we have 31 third grade boys of all nationalities. And basically it's, it's a component, it's several components. There's a mentoring component. There's a STEM component. There's a multimedia and digital arts component. And we're trying to use these things to inspire these young men. Um, there's some research that says that young boys either check out or check in the education at the third grade. So we're doing our part to try to make as many of them check in as we possibly can. And yes, the Tenacious Men and the Brief Project will interact uh, once it's safe to do so. All right. Thanks again. I've had a great time this evening. I hope I didn't bore you too bad and I hope I didn't uh, kill you with my sax playing. I did my best. So if you liked it, great. If you didn't, Oh, well, hit mute next time you see me playing. That's it. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>